The phone rang at the graduate college one afternoon in the spring of 1940. I picked it up. It was Professor Wheeler. He said my name, Feynman. Then he said he knew why all electrons have the same charge and the same mass. I waited. Then he said, because they are all the same electron. He was not joking. John Wheeler, my thesis advisor, had just proposed that every electron in the entire universe, the ones in your body, in distant stars, everywhere, was actually a single electron zigzagging back and forth through time. It was the craziest idea I had ever heard, and it would change my life forever. I arrived at Princeton in the fall of 1939. I was 21 years old, fresh from MIT and completely out of place. Princeton was nothing like MIT. At MIT, we wore whatever we wanted. We talked however we wanted. Here, there were dinner gowns and formal teas. On my very first day, the dean's wife asked me if I wanted cream or lemon in my tea. I said, both, please. I wasn't paying attention, and she laughed nervously and said, Surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman? I wasn't joking. I just didn't know you couldn't have both. I had expected to work with Eugene Wigner for my PhD. Instead, I was assigned to John Archibald Wheeler. Wheeler was only 28 years old, just 7 years older than me. He dressed like a banker. Suits, ties, polished shoes. He spoke softly, politely. He had the manners of a minister. At our first meeting, he pulled out a pocket watch and placed it on the desk between us. He was timing our conversation. I understood the message. So before our second meeting, I went out and bought a cheap pocket watch of my own. When I sat down, Wheeler pulled out his watch. I pulled out mine and set it right next to his. There was a pause. Then we both burst out laughing. That was the beginning of everything. Wheeler treated me like an equal from the start. Not like a student, like a partner. We would sit in his office for hours arguing about physics. He would throw out wild ideas, I mean really wild ideas, and I would try to calculate whether they could possibly work. Most professors were cautious. They stuck to what was proven. But Wheeler. Wheeler was a raging nonconformist hidden inside a conservative suit. He believed that if an idea didn't obviously violate the laws of physics, it was worth exploring. Together, we developed something called the absorber theory of radiation. It was a new way of thinking about how charged particles interact with each other. The mathematics were beautiful. But there was a catch. Our equations worked just as well running forward in time as backward. That's when Wheeler called me with his one electron idea. Imagine, he said, that instead of billions of electrons, there is only one. This single electron starts at the beginning of time and traces a path through space. Sometimes it moves forward in time, and that is an electron. Sometimes it loops back and moves backward in time, and when it does, that it looks like a positron. Every electron you've ever seen is just this one particle, crossing and recrossing through the present moment over and over again. I thought about it. I said to him, But Professor Wheeler, there are not as many positrons as electrons. If your idea is right, there should be equal numbers. He paused. Well, maybe the extra positrons are hidden in the protons or something. I did not take the one electron universe seriously, but I did steal something from it. The idea that positrons could be represented as electrons moving backward in time. That idea would become central to everything I did later. Early in 1941, Wheeler told me it was time for me to give my first professional talk. He said I should present our absorber theory at the departmental seminar. I was nervous, but I agreed. Then Professor Wigner stopped me in the hallway. He said my name, Feynman. He said he had invited Henry Norris Russell one of the greatest astrophysicists alive. I nodded. He said John von Neumann is coming too, the mathematician. I swallowed. He added that Wolfgang Pauli is visiting from Zurich and he will be there. Pauli, the man famous for destroying theories with a single sentence. He once said of a bad physics paper that it is not even wrong. Pauli, 
I must have turned pale, because Wigner tried to reassure me. He said if Professor Russell appears to fall asleep during your talk, do not worry. He always falls asleep. And if Polly appears to be nodding, do not assume he agrees. He has palsy. That did not help. Then Wigner mentioned that Professor Einstein had expressed interest in attending. He rarely comes to these events, but your topic interests him. Einstein. I went to the seminar room early. I started writing equations on the blackboard. Then I heard a soft voice behind me. It said, hello, I am coming to your seminar. Could you perhaps direct me to the TA? It was Einstein. I showed him where the T was. My hands were shaking. Wheeler had promised to answer questions for me, so I pulled my notes from a brown envelope and began. I remember almost nothing of the talk itself. My mind went into a kind of trance. I just focused on the physics and forgot about the audience. When I finished, Polly stood up. He said he did not think the theory could be right because of this and this and this. He turned to Einstein and asked, don't you agree, Professor Einstein? Einstein replied with a long, thoughtful German, no. Then Einstein said something I will never forget. He said our theory had problems with general relativity, his theory. But he added that after all, general relativity is not so well established as electrodynamics. He said he would not use that as an argument against us because maybe we can develop a different way of doing gravitational interaction too. Einstein, the creator of general relativity, was willing to consider that his own theory might need to change. That's what a real scientist looks like. Then the war came. Wheeler went to Chicago to work on nuclear reactors with Fermi's group. Later, he went to the Hanford site in Washington State, where they were building the reactors that would produce plutonium for the atomic bomb. I went to Los Alamos. We worked on different parts of the same terrible project. Wheeler was solving the mysteries of reactor physics he figured out why the B reactor at Hanford suddenly shut down, discovering that Xenon-135 was poisoning the chain reaction. His work kept the plutonium production on schedule. I worked on the theoretical physics of the bomb itself, calculating how the chain reaction would proceed and how much energy would be released. Wheeler had a younger brother named Joe. He was a historian, not a physicist. Joe went to fight in Italy. In 1944, Joe sent Wheeler a postcard. It contained just two words, hurry up. He was asking his brother to finish the bomb before the war killed him. Joe Wheeler was killed in action in October 1944. The bomb was not ready in time. Wheeler carried that weight for the rest of his life. He wept about his brother even as an old man. After the war, I went back to theoretical physics. I kept thinking about the ideas Wheeler and I had developed together. That crazy theory about electrons moving backward in time? I turned it into something useful. I developed a new way of calculating quantum interactions, path integrals, and Feynman diagrams. In 1965, I won the Nobel Prize for that work. Wheeler went his own way. He became obsessed with gravity, with Einstein's general relativity. He studied collapsed stars, objects so dense that nothing could escape them, not even light. In 1967, at a NASA conference, Wheeler was trying to explain these objects. He kept saying the phrase gravitationally completely collapsed object, but that was such a mouthful. Someone in the audience shouted, how about black hole? Wheeler loved it. He had been searching for the right term for months. From that day on, he used black hole everywhere he went. The name stuck. Wheeler also invented the words wormhole and quantum foam. He coined the phrase it from bit, he trained more great physicists than almost anyone in history, 46 PhD students, including people like Kip Thorne, who would go on to win the Nobel Prize himself. Wheeler never won the Nobel, but everywhere you look in modern physics, you find his fingerprints. I think back to that phone call sometimes, the one about all electrons being the same electron. It was wrong, of course. The universe does not work that way, but that is not the point. The point is that Wheeler was willing to ask the question. He was willing to look at something everyone took for granted, the existence of multiple electrons, and ask, what if we are wrong? Most scientists play it safe. They stay within the boundaries. John Wheeler taught me that the boundaries are where the interesting questions live. He made me the physicist I became, and for that, I owe him everything.